If there has been a silver lining to the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been the ability to reconnect with some of the old friends and many of the people that I've served over the years. Today's podcast episode of From the Touchline is another special one, as I interview my friend, Greg Dalby. And it's a real privilege for me because not only did I get to serve Greg during his time with the Colorado Rapids and beyond, but he's invested back into me and Soccer Chaplains United. For many years, he served on our board of directors, and we've stayed in touch and connected through many different circumstances, epidemics, pandemics, life challenges, time zones, and all the rest. Well, enough of listening to me. I can't wait for you to hear part of Greg's story and the recent phone interview that I had with him. So don't go away. We'll be back after this. Just a little off foot, thinking he's going to go far post. Not strong enough with his right hand. Whips that one in. Far post, almost made him in, and they have. He has the hat trick. The second in his career. The third of the night. The hat trick hero. Talked about you're not going to be able to sustain that kind of pressure. To the corner. Goes towards the near post. And you're the angle. And what a goal. What a goal. Well, on today's episode, I have a very special friend and guest with me, Greg Dalby. Greg is first assistant coach with Penn State men's soccer, and he formerly played professionally in the U.S. and Europe after graduating from Notre Dame University. Welcome to the Touchline, Greg. Thanks, Brad. Glad to be here. Greg, we've known each other for a long time now. What's it been, some 10, 12 years or so? Um, yeah, it would have been early, I guess, just before 2000 and nine so yeah quite a while now yeah I, th- I think i thought it was october ish 2008 uh i forget when you joined the club so so greg you were actually drafted by the colorado rapids where i volunteered as mm-hmm. chaplain in january of 2007 but i think it was fall 2008 that you eventually rejoined the club uh mm-hmm. snuffed us off a little bit i i didn't even I had remembered, I think you were our top draft pick in 07. Um, and I remember like reading about that and then wondering, where is this guy? Uh, I didn't realize <laughs> you had gone to, yeah, I didn't realize you had gone to Europe, but, yep. um, Hey, share with us a little bit of your football journey leading up to coming to the Colorado Rapids. Well, first, um, just thanks for having me, Brad. I, I really appreciate it. And, um, as the conversation goes on, I think some of our, our friendship and, you know, my respect, uh, for you and the way that God used you in my life to grow me is, um, just been instrumental. So, so happy to be here. Um, but with that, I will take issue with the word that you use, snuff. Um, I, I felt. <laughs> I did not snuff the Rapids. I made it really clear that I was um, desiring to go play in Europe because that's what I had always dreamt of. And I had been around players, um, you know, youth national teams and college um, and, and just grew up uh, desiring this uh, adventure and this journey. And um, Europe is, is where I wanted to go. And maybe those were, were very selfish goals of mine, but that's what I wanted to do. And the Rapids, I think, um, knew that. And um, I think also thought, you know, this could be, this could come full circle in a year's time. And, and they were correct. And in a year's time that um, for the soccer purposes, you know, it wasn't a, a great decision for developing my career. And so I came back, uh, some people think with my tail between my legs, but for me, it was like, this is the next best thing. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to join the Rapids and um, be challenged in that area too. Greg, thanks for that clarification, because you're right. <laughs> you know, sometimes as the chaplain, we don't know all the backstories behind why a person signs or doesn't sign. And mm-hmm. for those listening that aren't from the U.S. and you're not familiar with Major League Soccer, uh, throughout the years, it's had many different wonky, to use that word, uh, mechanisms. And so uh, much like the uh, our counterpart in American football, the NFL, MLS hosts the draft and it drafts out the collegiate players and and so it's it's kind of weird because it's like the MLS lays claim or can lay claim to certain people uh, via this draft mechanism. And essentially, they they get the rights to a player. And this has changed over time, and it, and, and it gets yeah. adapted, you know, because you have people like David Beckham coming into the league. And so the league goes, oh, let's make exceptions. Um, so, <laughs> so, Greg, appreciate the clarification. You didn't necessarily snuff the Rapids. Your, your, your dream, your vision was to go to Europe. And so the Rapids yep. go – well, we're going to, we're going to at least snatch up this guy's rights. Cause he, he's so 
he's so talented as a player. He's so handsome. Uh, no, I'm just kidding there. But um, they they had their own desires for you, and it was almost like, well, let's see if this works out. And and that's kind of what mm-hmm. you're saying there, right? Yeah, quite the opposite. They they thought surely this guy's going to fail and fall on his face in a year's time. He'll be back, so let's let's pick him up. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, Greg, tell us what was it like? Um, you were at Notre Dame. Uh, mm-hmm. I, you won. You won a cut. You had a couple uh, recognitions there, uh, and then graduating from Notre Dame. What was next? How did would you would you move on to what what was that first? sort of stage what did things look like what was your journey like that year year and a half in europe yeah it was um a little bit of uncharted waters so i i had for context and i don't mean this in a in a boastful way at all um and quite the contrary i think the longer i've been in the game you you begin to realize how little uh, public recognition actually means and I think the the recognition you should be looking for is respect from your your teammates and opponents first, um, you know, and, and maybe coaches next, and um, you know, viewers last last on the list. And um, I had I had left college with um, a good resume. I had been recognized in high school as um, the high school Gatorade Player of the Year in college. You know, we won some trophies, not not the national championship, but um, was recognized as a all American twice and recognized for some leadership awards at, at Notre Dame and, um, and also captained our, our youth national team, our under 20 side in a, in a youth world cup, um, in Holland. And we won a group, um, that we had no business winning against Argentina, Egypt, and Germany, uh, only to, only to then lose to Italy in the first knockout round. But, um, for all intents and purposes, um, I came from a you know a good environment and I felt like I was um, developed uh, at a good level against very good competition and again kind of as I I said previously I really wanted to to go to Europe and as a young American you grow up we didn't really I didn't really grow up um, watching the MLS because it didn't exist and so as a kid you grow up watching um, you know Fox Sports recap of the weekend as a, a show that would kind of give a a two minute summary of every game in the EPL. And, um, I idolized that. And I grew up thinking that's, that's where I want to be with the, the passion and the crowd, the, the style of play, the level, um, you know, of intensity of pressuring transition moments and so many things. And I thought that's, that's for me. And, and playing in the youth world cup, I got to play against Messi and Zavaleta and, and some of these top world players at the time, maybe weren't that, but on their way to it. And, um, I don't think I, I arrogantly um, thought, you know, I'm at the same level, but um, for where I wanted to go and how I had grown up, you know, observing these um, these leagues as a young kid, that that's where I wanted to be was in Europe. Um, and so uh, after Notre Dame, um, I arranged an agreement with a, with an agency and uh, with with promise of opportunities and trials, uh, you know, around Europe and kind of packed a bag and set off on this, on this adventure, um, that, that, um, I thought had a, you know, a definitive destination, but come to find out it, it took several trials and, um, you know, tribulations I would describe and this reason or that reason for not getting picked up and, um, had some really good trials, had some ones where I didn't, I didn't, uh, show well for myself, but it was, it was about a, a six to seven month journey before I finally landed at a club. Um, so in that, in that seven months, it was a pretty trying time because I think I had, I had set off with high hopes and great ambition and, um, basically just felt like I took a lot of punches for, you know, the better part of eight months. And you're separated from family. You're away from the familiarity Mm -hmm. and the support of Notre Dame and community Mm -hmm. friends, church life, et cetera, and, and all the different aspects. But, um, so you're, you're really on your own. You're alone in Europe. You're you're working through these different trials and uh, where'd you finally land? What was, what was the team? So eventually I, I ended up at a club in Belgium in their, their top division called Sporting Charleroi. Um, and it was, uh, is currently, or was um, owned by a gentleman that had spent a lot of time in the United States. And I think he, he had context for the level I had come from and uh, they gave me a chance. Um, and so, you know, I was, I was, it was not where I thought I would be. Um, but it was a, a wonderful opportunity. And, you know, for anyone here that's familiar with some of the leagues in Europe, the Belgium league is, is very good. Um, and a lot of traffic of, um, you know, 
good players come through Belgium and move on to, you know, what we recognize as kind of the bigger, the bigger leagues in France and Germany and Italy and England. And, um, but I think, you know, that second tier of level in Europe, Belgium's, you know, one of the better destinations you can land at. So this is really a stepping stone club to the ultimate dream for you, at least, Mm -hmm. uh, or a stepping stone opportunity and open door play here. And you're likely to be seen by scouts in, uh, at, at, at the other leagues where you might want to grow and get into. So, uh, tell me a little bit, what were things like at Char- Charleroi? Did I, did I pronounce that correctly? Charleroi? Charleroi. Yep. Very good. Okay. Bon. And, um, so, and, yeah. and it's in Belgium. So describe to us a little bit what, because there are Greg, there, there are some athletes that, uh, you know, on, on both men's and women's side that will listen to the podcast and they're young aspiring Americans are playing in some academies overseas or they're, they're trying to get their wits about them to make next steps. So, so what was it like there in, in Belgium? What was your experience? Um, highs and lows. Um, I, I think of my, I reflect on my experience and I kind of compartmentalize the soccer and the, the life, the life part of it. Um, from a soccer standpoint, so much different than what I had thought. Um, again, I, I had I had come from some some good environments playing in youth national teams. So just the the support, the equipment, the facilities, um, all these things that you feel like will just get better as you get older or play. You know, finally, I'm a pro player. I'm getting a paycheck. Um, but it, it was, couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, these are, these are clubs that are, um, trying to, to stay up, trying to keep it, trying to make good deals with good players and, and sell them off. And so, um, operationally it was, um, it just didn't have that cachet that, that you would expect. I, and honestly, you find out you're, you're quite spoiled growing up in America with the, the fields you get to play on, the shoes you get to wear. And, um, not that it was, you know, um, I was certainly wasn't playing in poverty or anything like that. Um, but it, it was just different. I was playing in a lot of reserve trainings, a lot of reserve games. And you go from, you know, playing in the youth world cup and playing in big college soccer games. And, you know, you're at Maryland in a great environment, um, to playing in NCAA tournament games against Maurice Adu and Robbie Rogers and Chris Seitz and guys who are very, very good players. And then you're playing in a, in a reserve game uh, in an empty stadium in Belgium on a Sunday afternoon with kids who are like 15 years old, um, you know, and, and some season pros in there too, just the way every club handles reserve games. And so it was, I had to do a lot of growing up and maturing as a player to think, you know, I've got a job to do. And, and my role here is not to worry about what's around me, but basically get on with it. And I'm a professional and I had a hard time with that at first. And, um, I, I realized there was some things that I wasn't prepared for. Um, the, you know, the cultural part of playing in Europe was colder than I had expected. Again, you come from, um, youth national teams and college where you're around people your own age and you can speak the language with them. And it's, um, you, there's a lot of fun. There's a lot of banter. Um, you know, so all that was kind of taken away and it's really like, how good are you? Um, and, and you have a little bit of a target on your back. I think, um, this is just my opinion, but I felt like an American, it took me a long time to win people over, um, just by consistency of, um, being reliable as just as a person, um, being reliable as a player, um, my work ethic, I felt like all this stuff, you know, I really had to work hard at it to, I'm not talking about playing. I'm just talking about earning people's respect in the locker room. Um, you know, who is this guy? Who's this, you know, this kid from America who's here kind of trying to take my job and, you know, we don't rate the way he plays and it's just style of play was even different for me. And, um, so that, yeah, there was, there was a lot of things at play. And, and as you mentioned earlier, Brad, the, support system outside of you. So referencing family, friends, um, speaking language, things like that. But then came the next layer, which was my own confidence and something I had always been um, very good at soccer um, and a leader and someone who was always on the, the up and up. I mean, I felt like it got stripped away from me and, and I, I totally lost my confidence for stretches there. And, um, I found that to be really difficult. Yeah, it's almost like all of your history, uh, all of the credibility that you had earned and gained throughout your career leading up to then, 
you, you, you couldn't carry that across the Atlantic with you in many ways. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, no, I mean, again, if, if I could illustrate it, try telling uh, a, a fellow European pro that you were a good college soccer player and he would look perplexed would, would be his response. You know, what is that? Oh, you played on a university team. And it, and it does not compare in America. Doesn't translate. Yeah. yeah, in America, the, the college pathway, I really believe in it. I don't think it's the pathway, but I, I do believe it. it's, a, it's a proven alternative pathway to the next level. And for some guys, it's, it's wonderful. And for other guys, it's not. It's not, it's not the right way to go. But um, for me, um, you know, that gave me zero credibility there. So, Greg, in, in terms of just Belgium itself <clears throat> or your, your moments through Europe, you, you land at a new club. Maybe you're there on a, a one-week, two-week trial. What, what do you do? I mean, I imagine there's there's going to be a young athlete listening to the podcast, uh, either in present form or later on down the road, and they're they're going to wonder like, how do how do I maintain confidence? How do I quickly try and build a support system? What what are the things that I need to do? to take on those challenges to be successful. What were some things, I mean, did you ever get into a town and, and look for the nearest, you know, U S contingent or like, how, what, like, how did you build support for yourself? Did you, uh, or was that something you had to learn and, and how did you do it? Yeah. It's, it's hard to answer that. Cause now looking back, um, you know, it's an easy answer, but at the time, um, at first, it was like, this is exciting. I'm in a new city. Let's explore. Oh, this is so fun. I'm trialing at Nuremberg, a big Bundesliga club. Like, how cool. And let's get out in the town. And um, But after a while, you start going to these other clubs where the town's not as warm and welcoming or fun to walk around. There's not even a city center in certain places. Um, and so, you know, I, Brad, my experience has taught me that um, confidence comes from good preparation. And so, you know, I think it's important to remember where you've come from and, um, and not be as impacted by the outside influencers around you. Um, and so for me, uh, speaking now, present day, to myself then, I would have said, hey, you, you're prepared for this. You've come from a good environment. You need to basically remember where you've come from and that you, you, are, you are ready to compete at this level versus – looking around, trying to fit in, um, the, the cold reality of going on a trial is, um, you're there to earn a position and prove that you're there to be good at something. And so in training in reserve games, whatever it may be, you have to display that you're good at something and that there is a monetary value that you're going to bring to this club. And that's why they're going to pay you, um, to, mm -hmm. to really strip it down and, and be really blunt about it. And now as a coach, I think I'm on the other side and, looking at like, okay, if I was a coach and I had to look at a player coming in, like, what is it that they do well? Why are we going to pay this guy? Um, and so to bring it full circle, I think having a routine um, of, you know, how you approach every day, you know, keeping um, scheduled, honestly, a lot of what's going on right now with the coronavirus is, you know, waking up, keeping a routine, working out, having breakfast, getting dressed, you know, all these things that keep your mind from wandering, um, I think is one of the biggest temptations that you can fall into there. Um, you almost can defeat yourself before anyone is allowed to even defeat you uh, in, the, in those trial experiences. But I think having a strong, sound mind and, um, you know, be it a, a phone call to someone that, you know, you feel like you can be uh, transparent with to say, acknowledge that this is difficult, not easy and very new, but also, you know, give you a, a word of encouragement um, at the right time in the right way. Yeah, Greg, as you share, I, I go back a little bit and I go, and what was I doing in 2007? And, and I can honestly say, you know, I've been five years into being the volunteer chaplain with the Rapids, but my vision was not even quite broad enough to go, hey, there's, there's an athlete out there without support. And, and that's where I am today, where I'm like, I know that there's athletes in other countries buying their trade, but still trying to figure out their faith, still trying to figure out life. And, uh, and that's, that's galvanized me a little bit more with a different vision where I'm like, man, back in 07, I think I just was just trying to survive a little bit in the workforce mm. and do the chaplaincy with the rapids. And, um, today I know that's different today. I, I have a broader vision to go, 
know, I, I know there's people that are beyond MLS, beyond USL, beyond the U.S. game, uh, and how can we support them? But Greg, thanks, thanks for sharing that that part of the story. Now, now you shared with me a while ago a story about your time in Belgium, sort of a culmination story, and I kind of want to get into this story a little bit. Tell us mm-hmm. a little bit more about the Puma shoes, the white Puma shoes. Well, it just shows your your uh, was it Puma? Astute, mem- astute memory, Brad. It was um, it was in Germany, not in Belgium. Um, oh, okay, but correct. They were uh, they were all white Puma shoes, and so um, just to kind of lay the groundwork, as I mentioned earlier, I had set off for this Germany basically to start my new life after college um, with a pro career in Europe, and, and just packed a bag, and just said, you know, this is all I need for now. And so it, it had uh, the necessities, a few books in there, um, you know, some running shoes. What, what were, wait, wait. What were those books? Do you, do you remember them? Um, I do, yeah. There were um, some Vince Wynn books. One of my um, – the late Vince Wynn, actually. Um, he's one of my favorite kind of just uh, um, fiction authors, and um, they're kind of CIA espionage thrillers, and they're, they're total page turners. You can get lost in them, and um, they're excellent. <laughs> Cool. Nice. Um, so, so yeah, I, like I said, I, I had a bag and, um, you know, it just had the, the bare necessities. You're going on a trip and you don't know how long you're going to be there, but it had basically everything I needed as long as I could keep washing things. And so, you know, a pair of running shoes, um, my boots, chin guards, you know, shirts, jackets, things like that. And, um, just what I would call kind of my, my street shoes with this, uh, brand, brand new pair of white Puma shoes I had purchased before I, I took off. And, um, so I set off on, you know, this trip and over time, as you know, shoes get dirty, especially bright white shoes. And I had been doing lots of traveling on trains and airplanes and taxis and, um, you know, staring various areas and, um, walking in city centers. And so these shoes began to get a little bit, um, worn down and it would be obvious to anyone that just saw me that my shoes were, were dirty. Um, and so, to take you this is about six months into my trip now um i was in a, a town in germany <clears throat> and i had um it, it was it was a low point i was struggling just with um, i'm an analytical person and mm-hmm. by nature and you know i thought that this is where god had wanted me to go on this this trip to to europe only to kind of take me out there and let me kind of fall on my face is what it felt like, you know, mm-hmm. questions, you know, I resonate with a lot of the songs like, God, why are you doing this? Where are you? Why aren't you answering my prayers? And, um, felt very, uh, lonely, even the, the time change to communicate with family. I'm from California. So, you know, however many hours that is from, from Europe, it, it was hard to connect with people. And so, um, not a lot to cling to and, and kind of feeling like, especially a young guy that, um, as a Christ follower, like your, your hope is in him. And I wouldn't say I was fully mature in that area and, and still not fully mature in that area. And it's, you know, it's a journey, but, um, I felt like I was losing hope a little bit and my support cast was gone. My, my confidence, my, and something I'm good at was dwindling and, and spiritually you're like, man, what is happening? Like, I just feel embarrassed and I'm going from place to place and I'm not going to be in the national team fold anymore. And, you know, what's going on. And so, um, I tell you all that just to, to set the stage for, I, I was, I was starving for some encouragement, some connections. So I had looked up, um, the church I grew up in actually had a Bible college in this town called Ziegen, Germany. And, um, so I set off for my hotel and I get in the taxi and, um, show the taxi driver the address and, um, took, like 20, 30 minutes, and there was some construction around it. And so he actually, ironically, he couldn't drop me off at the church. He had to drop me off outside of this construction zone that goes on the other side of this neighborhood, and it was confusing. But anyway, I could see it, but I just I had to hop over a fence and go under some, um, you know, around this construction area and, and get to the church. And, um, you know, it was, it was kind of like 5 or 6 p.m. and starting to get dark, and I get to the church and um, full of, uh, hope and anticipation to just meet someone that speaks English that, you know, I share some bond of, um, you know, in reverence for, for Jesus and just to kind of unload on him a little bit and, and find some encouragement. And, uh, I get there and 
doors were locked and the curtains were drawn and the lights were off. And, um, man, it was, it was, uh, talk about getting kicked when you're, when you're down, you know? So I sat there for a few minutes, just super frustrated and kind of crying out to God, um, sat on a bench they had there and eventually starting to get cold and I was like, all right, well, there's a, a harsh reality of this. I need to get back to my hotel and not really sure how I'm going to do that. Cause I don't speak German and I don't have a phone and uh, the taxi driver dropped me off a ways from here and I couldn't tell him to wait. And anyway, so I tried to get out of there. And so, I, like I said, there was all this construction. And um, so it was dark now and um, I hop over a fence and um, get past this little caution tape area. And, and, you know, I can't really see where I'm going and I find out and start to begin to feel the the ground beneath my feet is um, very soft and loose. And I had walked through a big slab of, of recently poured um, cement. And, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm really feeling sorry for myself now. And this is, you know, these are my, my pride possessions here. And I, I, don't, I don't wash my clothes often. There's my only pair of shoes that are kind of for getting out and about. And oh, they're, for all intents and purposes, they're ruined. Um, so, so, so somewhere in Ziegen, Germany, there is a sidewalk with your size <laughs> 11 still implanted. No, it's funny. Concrete. I've thought about that. Some some poor, um, you know, construction worker that had worked hard to lay that concrete the next day was was mortified <laughs> when he say a big big mess. He probably had a jackhammer oh, out of there. Um, oh. I didn't sign it. I just left my shoe print, and so <laughs> I was I was bummed, Brad. And um, on a really superficial level, you know, I I can. I can have perspective that there's, there's greater problems in the world than, than my own. And, um, certainly, you know, a young kid trying to be a pro and gets his shoes ruined. But at the time, I, I think acknowledging, and I think I've grown up in this area a little bit more is like acknowledging, like when your feelings are legitimate and that, and that was tough. I mean, this was my hopes and dreams, um, basically slipping out of my fingertips. And, um, I felt like, um, my hope in the Lord was, was dwindling because I, I, I really believe that, that's where I was supposed to be um, through prayer, through conversation, through scripture reading. And, um, and just, I felt like the groundwork was laid at a young age. And um, so anyway, I, I, I get out of this, this wet slab of cement and I have to walk a little bit further. So I go to a gas station and I figure out a way to get a taxi and taxi picks me up and it was cold. And so we drove about 30, 30 or 40 minutes um, back to our hotel and the heat was on blast in the car. And, um, you know, dead silent. And I'm just kind of sitting there looking out the window and just wondering what's next. Like, mm-hmm. Lord, like you, what am I going to do here? Um, so anyway, taxi arrives at the hotel and drops me off. And, um, I take uh, a step out of the taxi and I hear this kind of like crunching, like I had stepped on something like a, some, an old, like uh, egg that had been cracked already and took another step. And, um, the cement on my white shoes had dried completely um, in the car and through the heat or, you know, I'd, I'd shaken them off. So there wasn't loads of it on there, but um, I, I stomped my shoes a few times. And as soon as I got into the hotel and the light was shown on my, my shoes, I had realized that the, uh, the adhesive from the cement once it dried had um, pulled a lot of the dirt, the muck, the accumulation of um, mess off of my shoes and had kind of, I wouldn't say brand new out of the box, but restored them to a pretty respectable state of, of wow. being really, these really nice white shoes. And um, for me at that time, that was a, um, uh, a very um, tangible gift of an illustration from God of how uh, he does regularly. He draws us out to draw us into him. And um, I felt like there, this was this, long drawn out time of dependency on him where, you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit, you know, there was times where I was angry. I was upset with him specifically and felt like I had lost hope. And, um, and this was a, uh, an illustration for me of like, I'm, I'm going to bring you closer to me and, and, and restore you and um, basically kind of make you whole again through this whole process uh, was, was wow. kind of the, the illustration that I took away from it. So it was a gift. It yeah. was, um, yeah. we talk about modern day gifts of provision and um, the Lord speaking. And, and I, and I 
for me in that moment, um, just the, the emotion um, built up into it, it was um, it really was a gift, um, uh, and it was humbling because as you're complaining, you're you're um, rejoicing with gratefulness for something to to hope hope for that God is gonna um, is gonna kind of not clean this mess up, but um, He will restore you know me as, and as I felt I was I was pretty beat up at the time. Yeah, Greg, as you share that, it just reminds me of. Uh, it reminds me of a passage of scripture where in Psalm 51, David has gone through this whole ordeal and he's really struggled and he's got the muck and mire of life on him. And he writes in Psalm 51, seven, he goes, cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And, uh, and, and later on, actually the prophet Isaiah says this of the nation. He, he's writing to a nation that's really been going through and is going through this ordeal and uh, he writes the words of God to the nation, and, and God says, Come now, let us settle the matter. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And it's as you share that story, like we go through these moments of life where we, we just, we're stuck in it. We're, uh, we have to trudge through some dark places, some difficult places. We, we get we get crap for better uh, lack of better word. Uh, there might be other words we use, but uh, we get stuff on our shoes of life, and and God does this this cleansing work in our lives, kind of as you said. And and what a what a neat story to so so what happens as you move from you walk back into the hotel, shoes are restored. Um, then then what goes on? Like what happens next in your in your Europe experience? <laughs> Well, it wasn't it wasn't a, a fairy tale, um, so, so to speak. Uh, that that trial continued and didn't go well. Um, I, I honestly don't recall if there was one more step before going to Charleroi, but it was shortly after um, where I had gone on trial to Charleroi and and uh, earned a contract, it was just a one year deal with an option for a second year that eventually um, I chose to decline. But um, but yeah, that is, and and then marked the, the beginning of a new journey where you know all the things I kind of longed for was like oh, I just want to be settled. I want to. You know, I wish I had a regular train environment. I feel like a stranger everywhere I go. And um, and so um, I think it was just a um, just a seed of hope in a time where I was starving. Um, and, you know, and, and and needing acknowledgement that um, God is God is there. And there's so many promises in Scripture. Um, it's funny. I um, as you as you reference scripture, Brad. Um, I uh, I resonate a lot with um, Israel and their story and their um, their unfaithfulness at times. Um, and I'm and I'm not too proud to admit that I I go through seasons of doubt and struggle and um, and as you know they do too. And for me, Brad, Deuteronomy eight was was something that um, I'll just read a, a short excerpt from it, if that's okay. Yeah, um, yeah. And so in Deuteronomy 8, um, starting in verse 2, it says, Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would really obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry, then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people need more than bread for their life. Real life comes by feeding on every word of the Lord. Um, and so for me, that, that scripture, this, this idea again of um, God drew his people out, um, took away the things that they, they took away their land, their, um, you know, everything they had known um, to then bring them closer to him. And, um, you know, the, the story goes on and, you know, there's, there's even complaining as they, um, were given a gift. They, they complained to God with manna in their mouth. Um, and so I, I would be very much like them. Um, and you know, it's, I, I think I'm just trying to resonate with people that have feelings and, and acknowledge like, you know, the life of a, of someone who's following God is not easy. Um, and it can be very difficult. And a lot of yeah. times we can associate circumstances with his love and, um, I think the other thing that's, you know, was beautiful about illustration of the shoes is I did nothing. <laughs> um, yeah. like it, it was, it was a gift and the restoration was a free gift. Um, and you know, I didn't, nothing I really had to do. Um, and so that, that to me was, um, just hope that took me into that next season of life of, 
uh, to answer your question of, you know, starting to, to play for Charleroi. Well, Greg, you know, you use the word several times in your own story, and then you, you even reference it here at Deuteronomy 8. Uh, and I'll, I'll put the, uh, I'll put links to all the scripture that we mentioned today so that folks can kind of track with and find it. But you talked about and used the word hungry. And, and I think every athlete, coach, anyone in the sport of football, soccer can identify with that feeling and that sense of we're hungry. Uh, sometimes athletes will say, I'm hungry for more playing time, or I'm hungry mm-hmm. for a new contract, or I'm hungry for the game, or I'm hungry for X, Y, and Z. But, but what you're describing is a spiritual hunger. And you talked about it in Germany. You, you went to the church looking for <laughs> spiritual support, emotional support, that sort of uh, sense of common ground. And, and that, that journey of hunger, um, is, is often what God uses to draw us closer to him. We, we don't feel that sometimes, right? Sometimes it feels more like a, a curse or, or it feels like punishment or it feels like judgment, but God's using it to, to teach us something and, and, to, and to let us learn something about him, about ourselves. And I just think, and you've, Greg, you've beautifully illustrated through scripture and through your own story that, um, just because we go through a moment of hunger, and we might even say now during coronavirus, people are hungry for something. They're hungry for their sports to come back. They're mm. they're hungry for their job to be stable or secure, or or they're hungry for something. But what if God's using these this moment, this time, this quarantine, lockdown, shelter in place moment to draw us closer to Him, to to feed us not physical food, but a spiritual food that can sustain us through, through so much more in life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think of, um, the comfort of presence, um, you know, and, and directly referencing, you know, the Holy spirit is, you know, there's, there's moments where you, you look around and everything you get stability from confidence, from comfort, from is taken away from you. And for me, again, like I know in the the grand scheme of the world, my problems weren't significant compared to many other people's, but um, it mattered to me at the time. And, and I felt like everything was stripped away from me. And um, I was hungry and thirsty for um, just God's presence or acknowledgement of, um, you know, hope that his scripture is, is rich of. And, um, you know, those are the things that I was, I was craving. And, and honestly, I think a lot of times, um, especially for a successful athlete, you, you can, you can think you're okay on your own um, and that, you know, I, I can just fix this by myself and I'm good enough or I've been good enough. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but at some point, you know, you, you just won't be, um, be at the end of your career, an injury, uh, a coaching change or, um, you know, a, uh, a coronavirus. Uh, yeah. A, I mean, a coronavirus or I'm, I'm just right? thinking of, of life now, you know, um, something totally, unforeseen circumstances in your marriage or your parenting. And, and, you know, like you, you, um, there is a, a satisfaction and a comfort in relying on, on the Lord that your spouse can't give you that the joy of seeing your kids laugh, which is amazing. Um, can't give you. And, you know, the quietness of, of being in God's presence and just feeling um, that presence is, you know, it, it kind of makes you feel like the world as if it should be in this moment right now. And um, once you've tasted that and experienced that, um, where you're not wanting, um, wishing, hoping for something, anything different in that time, um, you crave that more. Um, and, um, you know, I think those are things that God taught me when I was there is like, you, you need me. Um, you don't need a contract right now. You don't need, um, this or that, like you, you need me and I'm, I'm all that you need right now. And that, that was something I think that God really taught me, um, you know, that, that idea of drawing, drawing us out to, to pull us into him. And, and that's a, that's a point of maturity that I think is important for us to realize too, is that God God gently moves us there almost as a good parent or a good, a good father or mother might, might teach uh, their mm, child yeah. about that. And, um, you know, if, if people read on in Deuteronomy 8 in the next couple of verses there, it's interesting that verse 4 says, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Now, 
Now, for your story, Greg, we might have wanted to add, and you didn't walk through wet concrete, but um, <laughs> but but seriously, the there's a sense in which um, we sometimes strive for things in this life, but God's economy is 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 upside down. It's backward. It's um, we may not be the wealthiest in the world, but it seems like the the tread on our tires lasts longer. The the clothes last a little bit longer. They don't fray as quick. And, and there's a way in which God provides, uh, for our every need, but he may not provide in the way that we think he'll provide. Um, mm, yeah. I've, I've seen this a lot with sometimes the athlete that gets, uh, cut or waived or traded from one program. And then, um, they move, move into a different situation or scenario and God blesses them in a different way through that, or, mm-hmm. or even just their career, they thrive or flourish under a different coach. they, they end up um, making that that next chapter connection that helps them move on to to a different part of vocational life or career life uh, by going to the next team and uh, the next club. And so there's a way that God moves in that. And then verse five says, "Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you." And I I think as we realize that, you know, if, if you have children um, and and you you learn that they need rules and structure and discipline, uh, not in, not in a overly strong way, but, but they need that from someone older and wiser and further on down the road. Um, you don't want your kids eating candy all day long. It's, it's not good for them. So, right. We've yeah. got limits and restrictions on them. Although I've been known to enjoy a cookie, right. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's things like that where we have the, the parental overview to go, I know what's better or best for you. Mm-hmm. And if we can if we can see God in that way as well, that He He has this eternal view in mind, how much more so does He not know what's best for us? How much more yeah. does He know uh the next place we need to go or the next place we need to, to be with Him? Yeah, it's 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 as you say that, Brad, it's it's frightening to think about had I got the contract that um, was put in front of me at a, at a uh, championship side in England, um, you know, before my, my working visa didn't come through and, you know, just, just what that might've looked like for my, for, you know, the, the ripple effect of your, your life. Um, um, well, you know, God you does, know, you know Greg, he, yeah, I, I, I just want to pause you there because I want to say, because I know other parts of that story and because I've had so much fun today, I think, that's another call. We're like, we need to get another interview and talk through some of that as well. Right. The, the what if, because I think another sweet part of your story is the journey that God led you on and what he's, what he's done through that. So I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you there, but like uh, I'm, I'm in total agreement with you. And I'm like, Oh man, there's, there's another podcast is like hearing <laughs> what God has done in your story. Um, yeah is something special and amazing as well. Right. Yeah. No, I, I feel, um, just so blessed and so lucky as you, um, you know, look backwards, my, my wife and I, we had a, a stay at home date night and we, we kind of came up with five questions and we, we talked about like the, uh, reflecting on, uh, answered prayers. And, um, you know, I had always, um, desired a, a life and certain things beyond soccer and, and God, you know, gave it to me in, in abundance. Um, and again, by no, um, strength of my own, like just God, God was so generous. Um, and it would not have happened in this fashion, you know, had I not stubbed my toe <laughs> along the way in my soccer career. Right. Right. Well, Greg, thanks. Thanks for uh, coming on today and for sharing uh, a part of your story and, and helping illuminate that through scripture. I think that, you know, if, if you're one who's listening, whether you're an athlete or a coach or, or you're in or around the game, you know it a little bit. Maybe, maybe you've got a, a son or a daughter that's, that's entering into the game and, um, you know, wh- whatever level they may or may not achieve, like, I think that there's good learning to be had here. And there's, there's even a sense in which as we look at scripture, we can understand God's, God's journey with us through this, through the highs and lows that we go through. So Greg, thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Brad. Uh, wonderful to be here and um, just so so grateful for our friendship and, and time here today. Yeah. Well, today I want to leave us with a prayer. I, I don't know all the stuff that you've walked through or are walking through right now. I know that many in football have 
compromised and walked through some difficult times and situations, some of our own choosing, others that are totally out of our control. But no matter how dirty the shoes, no matter how dirty the boots of our lives, uh, I want to leave us with this prayer that's for cleansing, uh, a prayer that's, that's asking God to wash white again. Father God, football has taken me to so many places in the world, so many different places where I've walked, where I've run, where I've played. And in it all, I confess that perhaps I have forgotten you. I've forgotten you and how you brought me here. Amongst the bright lights, the wins, the successes, the challenges overcome. And on some grounds and on some pitches, I've walked through some nasty stuff, difficult stuff, the kind of stuff I don't want to think about or talk about. But I need you to wash me. I need you to cleanse me. Help me to realize that there are no boots that are too dirty that you can't clean them. Help me to accept that you've got the power to take my messed up life and transform it, to redeem it. Help me to know deep down inside that I am not too far gone. But you are writing a story, my story. And there is a land, a place of promise. And you will go with me and you will help me get there. Help me to believe. Help me to not forget. Wash these filthy boots of mine and make me clean, mind, body, and soul. Amen. Well, this is Rev. Brad and Greg Dalby coming to you from the Touchline.